they are concatenation of a linear function followed by a nonlinearity. So linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear. Okay, so that is how how typically neural networks are uh, are represented. This example is a fully connected two-layer neural network. So what are the two layers? Here, first one you see that is the input layer. Okay, so there you see the nodes here. They represent a scalar. Each node represents a scalar. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, six nodes, that means your input is a six-dimensional input. Okay, that will be your x. That x passes through this fully connected layer. All right. Why is it fully connected? It means that okay, each input node is connected to every output node for that layer. Okay, so what is so what are the layers? So layers you see here, this is okay here. Um, I don't know if this is uh, agreed upon notation, but I like it this way. That a layer is defined by one transformation. So input is passing through some transformation. You are getting an intermediate output. That is one layer. All right, and then second one that layer, which, whichever this is showing hidden layer, that representation goes through another transformation that becomes my second layer. So that is how I interpret it. This is called a fully connected neural network because each, each of these inputs is connected to every output node of that layer. Then second layer is also fully connected because each input node is connected to every output node of that layer. Okay, so that is a fully connected. Any questions so far? Yeah. Are they always fully connected? No, no, no. So fully connected is one one type of a neural network. Uh, you can have uh, later on we'll see there can be convolutional layers, there can be uh, residual layers, there can be these nowadays transformer layers. So yeah, layers come in different forms. So um, fully connected is probably the simplest and most general form. For the for the for the day, okay. All right. So other thing, just take it as a fact. Okay, a couple of more things. So layer, first layer. Let's say this is input. To say the zeros layer. Then this is your first layer, and then this is your second layer, for instance. When the layers are fully connected, then they can be represented by a matrix. So there will be a matrix for layer one. Then there will be another matrix for layer two, and I will be representing that as W one, W two. So uh, that notation will come later. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's continue with this. So um, it's also called multi-layer perceptron. Why so? Is because each of these, each of these uh, uh, sort of uh, node for any intermediate layer uh, can be represented using a perceptron. So what is a perceptron? It is taking uh, the way we saw it. It's just a that is where the linear terms, linear mapping comes in. That you are taking all the inputs of that layer, applying some weighted combination, applying some weight to each of those inputs, and then adding them together. That is what called what one perceptron. Okay, represented here. That each of those those nodes you see, they can be represented as a linear function w transpose x plus b. That is a linear function applied to the input of that perceptron, followed by this function phi, which is a nonlinearity. When we talked about perceptron, we said, okay, phi function for the perceptron, um, that hard decision boundary, that is a sine function, for instance, or is a step function. But that is not the only way we represent perceptron. Sigmoid can be a nonlinearity. Tangent hyperbolic can be a nonlinearity. Uh, your ReLU, which is a, another common one nowadays, that can be a nonlinearity. So the general process or uh, the, the most general form is that each perceptron, or sometimes, we also call it a neuron because we, that's where the term neuro, neuro net, neural networks comes in. That each perceptron or each uh, neuron can be represented by a linear function followed by nonlinearity. Okay? So, some of those things we'll discuss later. Other type of uh, nonlinearity that you typically see are uh, well, this is kind of classical one that you see in textbooks. Nowadays, you see other types of nonlinearities as well if you, if you just Google things. All right. Um, activation functions, nonlinearity. Sometimes we call that activation function as well. And again, motivation is from human kind of neuron where yeah, there's an, there's a potential that accumulates as thing as signals are coming in, and then once it reaches some threshold, there is a spike. So that is where 
this I think term activation function also comes in, but they are not really spiking networks. They are just just a kind of a functional. Um, uh, they are just functions. Okay. All right. Let me talk about some notations now. So this is where it becomes a bit. Um, Not complex, what's the word? Crowded kind of things. So, um, a general uh, multi layer perceptron we can represent using this sort of stack of these, uh, uh, these layers, and each layer is represented by, uh, uh, by a linear function followed by nonlinearity. Okay? Uh, in particular, this is, called, this is the way this network is shown it is, it's, you're getting an input, and then that input at this layer input of the neural network passes through some transformation that becomes your intermediate representation then that passes through another transformation becomes the your intermediate representation and it keeps going forward so that's called a feed forward network so there is no loop there are other types of network where there is a there is a loop that can come in but this is an example of a feed forward network so one thing to remember is just that output of a previous layer becomes input to the next layer and each layer is, is can be represented using a linear function followed by nonlinearity. Okay, first layer input is your data x. We are representing the linear part of that layer as a matrix W multiplied by the input plus a, a vector v, which corresponds to the bias terms. All right. Here you see these superscripts. Superscript one. For W and B, they represent the parameters for the first layer. All right. The, and phi is some nonlinearity. Uh, it can be whatever is your uh, is your desired nonlinearity. Then Y superscript one becomes the output of the first layer. Okay. Any questions so far? So this is this this is a representation for how first layer is mapping an input x to its output y. Okay, and all these superscripts, etc., are just representing the denoting the layer, layer one. Okay, all right. Output of the first layer becomes the input for the second layer, right? And things repeat. So now W two is the weight matrix corresponding to the second layer. B two is the bias term corresponding vector corresponding to the second layer. Phi is the nonlinearity corresponding to the second layer. Usually we say that they are all the same, so you don't see any any uh, layer wise index on the nonlinearity, but it can be different. You can have one nonlinearity on layer one, another nonlinearity on layer two. Okay, and keep keep doing that one. Okay. So output of the second layer is what? Matrix multiplied by the input of the second layer plus a bias terms followed by nonlinearity. That y2 becomes the input for the third layer and you keep going forward. <coughs> so in general, output of or layer L is getting an input, so that is y l minus one, which is the output of the layer minus one, layer l minus one, followed that passes through a matrix W, and then you add the bias term, then you pass it through a nonlinearity, and that becomes the output of that layer. Okay. And just to have this uh, everything consistent, we say that input is a zeroth layer, so then that x is the y zero, for instance. Um, some of the things to note are uh, uh, one thing is kind of the dimensions of these layers. So there are few things that are uh, that depend on the data. So the size of the input layer one is uh, it depends on what is the size of your input, right? So if your input is uh, is a vector of length two. Then the then the, the the size of the first layer is just a vector of length two. Is it just two? After that, what would be the size of the second layer, third layer, fourth layer, and so on? That is your design choice. Okay. So in general, I'm saying that each layer, Lth layer, contains KL um, output nodes. Okay. So KL, that superscript L, represents the layer L. That parameter is in your control for every layer except the last layer and the first layer. So first layer is coming from the data. Last layer comes from the task. So if you want to perform a binary classification, last layer can be just one scalar. If you want to perform a, a multi-class classification that you want an output to be a probability that whether your given x belong, what's the probability of that 
variable or uh, input corresponding to class 0, 1, 2, all the way to say 9, then we'll, it will be a 10 dimensional vector. So, what is the size of input and output is determined by the data? Size of intermediate layers, it just, uh, it's just your design choice. Okay? Any questions so far in terms of these notations? Okay. This part, I will just let you read it and I will switch to the handwritten notes and I will mainly follow uh, some of these notes that I already shared. So these are the notes from last year, I will just use them. I also on Piazza, I shared the, the notes that I am writing here, this, this notebook. So they are not very well organized but I just shared because some of you had the comments that it will be good uh, or your taking all the time to write the notes and don't pay attention. So I would rather have you pay attention to me than writing the notes. So if you just want to see these, I'll share them. It's just a pain to share it. So every time I have to share it, I have to refresh the link. So just be aware of that on Piazza. Okay, so a couple of things I want to uh, do. Let me start by showing something that uh, uh, that is, say, building on that network thing. So I, I will not write, I will not draw all the, all the connections, but, uh, but uh, just assume that they are all there, right? It's fully connected. So here you have x that is what? What's the size of this x? x belongs to a four dimensional space, right? The way I am representing it here. And then let's say this matrix represents your matrix for the first layer, right? How many outputs do you want in this matrix? How many outputs do you want from this matrix? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What will be the size of this matrix, W1? Such that it takes a vector of length 4 and maps it into a vector of length 6, right? So our so this, this part, which we are calling our Y1, will be, let's represent it as W1, X plus B1. And I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that in a bit, but just so that everybody is uh, clear on the notations, tell me what should be the size of this matrix W. Which is taking an input of length 4, mapping it to an output of length 6. It will be a 6 by 4 matrix, right? Okay, all right. Then you have this other matrix, which will be, again, assume that they are all fully connected. I just don't want to draw all these uh, things. So the output is, say, y2. This is your y2 now, which can be represented as w2, which is a matrix applied to the input of that layer, which is the output of the previous layer, w1 plus b2. So what should be the size of W2. It's taking a vector of length 6, mapping it into a vector of length 5. 5 by 6. Okay. So just so that everybody is clear on the notations. Any questions? No? Okay. So let me now <clears throat> switch to something uh, to further explain some of the notations. And to an extent, yeah, if you are going to implement it, much of this is not really, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know if it is necessary or not. At the end, you will not be, uh, you will, you, you need to know what, how do you, oh, okay, one, one more thing, important thing. So, I just mentioned here that we are representing these, this neural network as this, uh, as a stack of these uh, linear and non-linear functions, right? What will be the learning problem here? We haven't talked about it yet. So what will be the learning problem? What do you think? So let's take the example of this network, two layers, right? What will be the learning problem? What are we going to learn? or train, or update, etc. It will be these matrices, W1, W2, B2, B1. 
right? So those become the parameters. They represent that spy function, which is taking an input x, mapping it into a representation where a classification or regression is needed. Okay. All right. So let me start from the from a simple network just to further already the idea. So let's uh, take an example of a two-layer network. So let's take a two-layer network. Okay. Um, how do I do it? So let's say, let me start with one, one perceptron. So what is the single perceptron? I may need this pen to illustrate something. So let's take one perceptron. We already saw what it looks like. What is it? Y is phi times W transpose X plus G. Okay? So X is your uh, input. Let's say X. Uh, yeah, there will be some, some change of notation. So I'm going to change the notation. In the past, we used this notation, P, to indicate that it's the first entry of the vector X, second entry all the way to the dth entry. Uh, it just becomes too much to write these parentheses, so I will just change the notation to this. Okay, so subscript is now indicating first entry of vector x, second entry, third entry, and so on. That is your vector x. w, for this one, let's say it is w1 all the way to wd. Dimensions have to match, and uh, this w transpose x is what? It is just uh, element-wise multiplication of your input x with the vector w and then adding the beta. How do we represent in a graph? We represent uh, or in that in that structure tree, uh, the, the, the network structure that you saw, we represent that as follows, that we have first input, second input. So again, remember, these are the entries of a single vector, not like first sample, second sample. Okay, so these are just d entries of your single vector. This whole thing is a vector x. And uh, when we when we want to represent this uh, this single perceptron, if you will, what do we do? We say that you are multiplying this input first input with a weight say w1, second input with a weight of w2, dth input with a weight of wd. Okay, so x1 times w1 plus x. Okay, then plus you add them. That is where the plus comes in. X2 times w2 all the way to xd times wd, and then you add a b term plus b. All right, that is your one linear part of a perceptron. This will give you a scalar, right? We will use another notation to represent these scalars, so we will define them as z. Those are, those are our, say, intermediate uh, values, just the linear term. That z is passing through a nonlinearity, phi. That becomes our output, y. That is like a graphical way of showing that lean, that one equation. W transpose x followed by nonlinearity. Okay? All right. Now, let's uh, write down a two-layer network. So let me just write down the network, and then I want you to tell me what will be the matrix form of that network. So, I have vector input, let's say input is two-dimensional, x1, x2, let's say it is fully connected, so it's easy for me to define it, so uh, have something coming here, something coming here, I will denote these as some variable, define this as phi, that is the nonlinearity. That is one layer, uh, and uh, then let me connect it. Add it on beta, followed by nonlinearity, and this becomes my upper point. Okay. So, what do we have here? So this is not a square. This is the output of the second layer. So let's define some some boundaries here. What is this? This is what I'm calling my ah, shoot. This is what I call my 
layer one. Okay, this thing becomes my layer two. All right. Now we have to give some some um, some other. Uh, we have to we have to specify what are these edges. So okay, one more thing. Maybe maybe I can just define it here. So input each of these these dots you see here. They are the nodes. They are the input nodes. These uh, other ones that you see after that fully connected mapping two to two dimensional input to a two dimensional output. They are also your um, uh, uh, your nodes. So the line connected to nodes is an edge that is sort of come from the graph notation. And like we saw here, we, we assigned some values to each edge. That was the, the parameter we were multiplying with the input and adding to the, to the corresponding output node. So each edge here will be given some weight. That is where the, I guess the weight term also comes. Um, let me just write down here what, what values we assign to this. So we will say that this edge that is connecting the first input node to the first output node uh, Let's define that as uh, as this uh, W11. Okay, but let me first define the matrix. Let me go back to the matrix notation. So let's talk about the matrix world. So what was our what was our representation? Our representation was we have input x. Or let me go back to that original representation. Things are kind of flipped a bit. But what do we have? We have the output of the first layer, Y1, is this phi matrix applied to W1, which is a weight matrix for the first layer, applied to the input X plus this B term, Y term. Okay. We are saying that I want to map the input two-dimensional input to a two-dimensional output. So first layer has two two-dimensional output. So this this one here, this part here, over here, that is our Y1. That is a vector. It has two terms. So let me also write down what those two terms are. This is the first entry of that output of the first layer. This is the second entry of the output of the first layer. Okay. Y1 subscript is indicating the entry. Superscript is indicating the layer. Okay. That is what I see. I, I show you here. So Y first entry of the output, second entry of the output. Okay. Then I have this uh, phi matrix, uh, phi function. Let me just keep it as it is. Let me write down this weight matrix. So how can I write down the weight matrix? I can say that I have the first one one entry of that matrix. Then I have the first row, second column, one two entry of that matrix. Then I have two one, which is second row, first column of that matrix. Two two, which is the second row and second column of that matrix. That is multiplied with the input x1, x2, the first entry of the input and second entry. Then I have to add a, a, a bias term to this uh, uh, to this uh, to this uh, matrix vector product, and that dimension has to match. So I will add first entry of the bias for the first layer, second entry of the bias for the first layer. Okay, all right. Now looking at this, can you tell? Okay. Can you tell me, so Y1, if we look at Y1, let me choose this color. So Y1 is this input or this parameter. That is coming from this branch. So W11, 1, 1, 2, this first row of the matrix is multiplying with your vector and then you're adding this, this uh, bias term to that. Let me also put that bias term here. You have this first term of the bias adding to the uh, to this um, uh, to this branch, and visually, I, let's see if you agree with me. What is happening is that you are getting the input from both entries x1 and x2 for the input. You are multiplying them with the with the weights corresponding to these edges, adding the bias term for the first layer, passing the result through the nonlinearity. And that gives you the first output of the first layer. Uh, question? Why is 
Not really. But the, like, let's go with the matrix notation. We are saying the way we write the subscripts for the matrix entry is that wij is the ith row and jth column of the matrix. Right? So that is the notation here. Now let's, if we agree with this, this edge will be given the way it's w1, 2 for the layer 1. Okay? So if you get, a, if, you, if you just look at any weight, let me just write down here. So wij layer L is what? It is the layer L, right? That is obvious. It's not the power, it's just the layer. It's representing the layer. Uh, input J, output I. Okay, that's how it is represented. Uh, in the matrix form. So first row of the matrix is giving you the first output. Right? So rows of the matrix are giving you the output index. Columns of the matrix are giving you the input index. Depending on how, how comfortable you feel. Okay? Uh, let me move this a little lower and uh, expand this to, to indicate what we are doing above. What is it? We are doing phi applied to w11 first layer x1 plus w12 first layer x2 plus b1 first layer right so that is where this this thing completes so uh, the way I, I represented this line that you are multiplying input 1 with w11 with some weight input 2 with the corresponding weight adding the multiplying them uh, adding them together then adding the bias term and then you have this result over here. So we will be denoting it with some symbol. So Z1 for the first layer. And then uh, that term, so this term is our Z1 for the first layer. Okay. And again, there's a bunch of bookkeeping or uh, these uh, subscripts, superscripts that are coming in once you hopefully understand uh, uh, where they are coming from, it's not that that complicated. Okay, so Z is that linear term for that uh, for that branch or that layer, and then it is passing through the nonlinearity to give you the output. Okay. Similarly, for the second layer, uh, for not the second layer, the other branch that we have in the first layer, let me also highlight it. So where is that branch? Let me use uh, green. That is what I was using. The node. So what is that? This branch when you are multiplying the input with W21, W22, second row of that weight matrix, adding the, the bias term corresponding to that to get the second output, well, it is this other branch that, that you see. So first input multiplied by, multiplied by whatever is the weight of this branch. So that is, according to our notation, is W21 for the first line. Okay, what's the weight of the second? Branch, it is W22 for the first layer. Ah, for the first layer. Ah, too bad. First layer. Okay. So W21 multiplied by X1 plus W22 multiplied by X2 plus B2, that becomes our oh, B1. So B1 will, B2 will be added here. And that becomes our second entry for the Z vector. And that is passing through this nonlinearity to give us the output y21. Okay? Any question on this? So this was our y1 for the first layer. Second entry for the first layer is phi applied to w21 x1 plus w22 x2 plus b2 for the first layer. And this thing is what we call second output corresponding to that um, or to that linear part okay passing through the non-linearity so other thing i just uh, mentioned that there is a phi term that that non-linearity usually it is element wise non-linearity so we write it as phi applied to that vector but you have to interpret it as that phi is uh, is a, is a non-linearity applied to each scalar but you are applying to every entry of that vector independently you can combine them and do it uh, uh, in a, in, on a vector uh, representation, but um, 
but uh, but really we just do it this way. So there's there's nothing. Uh, the, the only way, the only reason I'm just expanding it is to give you clarity of what is happening. If if you are comfortable with that notation that we said earlier, this is what we have. We have we have B is a vector, W is a matrix, X is a vector. When you compute this W times X plus B, that gives you a vector Z. We are applying a nonlinear element wise nonlinearity on that Z to get the output for the first layer. Okay? And then you repeat this process for the second layer. Yeah, question? What's the point of the nonlinearity? Uh, in what context? Like, why, why can't we just have the V as B? Why is it nonlinear? That's an excellent question. Why? What do you think? Anyone else? Any? Any? That's a, that's a great question. So maybe hold hold on to that. Okay. Let's write down the expression for the second layer. Okay, and then then we can write down what the output looks like as a function of the input, and maybe that will. That will help us answer that question. So layer two, uh, layer two. What is layer two? If you look at this, we are taking the so now output of the first layer y one and y two for the first layer becomes input for the second layer. So let me just write down that y and it just has one output. So let me just write down it as uh, y one. Superscript 2 again, remember, I'm not writing parentheses, so 2 is not the power, it is the second layer, output of the second layer. So that is phi applied to this, uh, let's say, a matrix or one row because the output is one layer. Uh, 2, w1, 2, 2 times. First entry of the output of the previous layer, second entry of the output of the previous layer, plus b, which is the r the bias term for the second layer. Okay? Again, if you are if it is too much and yeah, generally we don't expand things in this way, we just perform vector vector uh, or matrix uh, algebra. This is just your um, this is this is just your Z for the second layer. Z for the second layer. Okay? It's just uh, it's just uh, uh, the output that you're getting is uh, uh, by applying a linear term, linear operation. In this case, a matrix, which just gives you one output on the input of the of that layer, adding the bias term. So let's also give these uh, annotate that on this graph. So what will be this? This is your weight matrix for the second layer, or weight entry for the second layer. This is your weight entry for the second layer, and this is your bias term for the second. Layer. Followed by the nonlinearity, and that gives you your your desired or final output. Okay, so that is what what I'm representing as the second layer. Okay, all right. So let's write down what does this uh, now your output? Can you represent the output y2 as a function of input? Yes, we can. So if you just look at this, y1 was this expression. So what, what is happening here? I don't have that notation on my notes, but let me just write it. Uh, <coughs> what was another way of writing this? We were saying that you have the second matrix for the second layer, input of the that second layer plus the bias term for the second layer, right? That is what your output is. But we already know the expression for the for the y1. So Output of the second layer can also be represented as follows: W2 applied to phi of W1 x plus B1, right? Then you have the B2. Make sense? So it doesn't have to be. Uh, it can be the same or it can be different. So it doesn't have to be the same. It can be different, but usually when we sort of design these uh, neural networks, we, we use similar nonlinearities. Okay? All right. So this is what the output looks like. Now, tell me, why is nonlinearity important? 
So what if phi is not a non-linearity? What if phi does not exist? What will happen to this expression? What is it? It will influence W? What do you mean by that? Uh, which W? Really, but let me let me remove W. Let me remove phi. So what will happen to this? You have this matrix W2, which will be multiplied by W1 x plus B1, and this whole thing will be added, right? So what do you have? You are multiplying a matrix with another matrix that can be represented as this W. Some other matrix. Product of two matrices will be another matrix, right? dimensions have to match. And then whatever is W2 times B1 plus B2, that will be another vector B. That will be your output. In other words, if you remove the nonlinearities and you just have these linear functions cascaded together, the output can be represented as a linear function of the input. Okay, so you're back to the linear classifier. So that's why nonlinearity is important. Because if you don't have nonlinearity after every layer, you cannot learn a nonlinear function at the end. You will be learning a linear function. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's move. I have ten minutes, and I want to. I thought I would be able to finish that question, but uh, uh, but yeah, let's let's move to the next main question. So here, here's an example of uh, of a two-layer network, where first the input is length two. Output of the first layer is length 2, it doesn't have to be, it can be length, any arbitrary length. And the output of the last layer, second layer, is just length 1. And there's a reason I, I started with this, because we want to solve uh, uh, a problem. Uh, with, I, I want to show you that we can solve this uh, uh, non-linear classification problem using this simple network. And the classification problem we will look at is the XOR problem. I mentioned it earlier, but let me just write it again. So, what is this? This is a problem. We talked about it last time that this is a kind of uh, this is a kind of uh, data that is not linearly separable, and uh, we cannot find a linear classifier that separates. In this case, the the, the opposite. Uh, the data that same labels correspond to the opposite uh, uh, corners of, uh, of, a, of a rectangle in this case. Okay? Or these, you cannot find a linear classifier to separate the red from the green. And uh, in terms of uh, the, the data values, we can represent that as follows. So what is the XOR problem is that if your both inputs are same, the output is 0, otherwise the output is 1. That is the XOR logic. But we can just think about the output as the label and the input as, uh, as just two-dimensional vectors. So I am also given them some names. So this is, say, data point A, B, C, D. Okay, so what is this A? This is A. Ah, oh, shoot. Why I use this color? So this is A. Where is B? B is the first coordinate is 0, second coordinate is 1. This is B. C is this. D is this. Okay? So can you find a single perceptron to separate the data into two classes? The answer is no. Right? Okay. Can you find multiple perceptrons to separate the data into two classes? That is the question for you. And let's Give me the answer. I want to at least uh, have the skeleton ready. Can you find, can you separate the data using two perceptrons? So what is a perceptron? Perceptron is a linear classifier, right? A line. Can you find one line to separate the data into two classes? No. Can you find two lines visually separate the data into two classes? Which ones? Tell me. Visually, what will be those lines? Uh, 
well, let's not define the value right now. Let's say we can have one line here. Did you want line here or somewhere else? Okay, this. Okay, what's the other line? Just above A. Okay, so this is what I wanted you to also tell me. Something like this. Okay, assume they are diagonal. Okay, based on this, how can you classify? How can you separate the data into two classes? Everything. How can you how can you how can you specify that? So again, we define a perceptron using uh, using that linear function followed by nonlinearity, right? So each of these lines or the output of these lines can be represented by an expression. Let's assume that we use the uh, we use the step nonlinearity. Okay, so phi we say that okay, this is W transpose x plus phi plus p, and then phi we use phi of uh, x is 1 if x is greater than 0, otherwise it is 0. Okay. So what it means is that if your uh, data is on one side of this classifier, then the output will be 1 for that classifier. If your data is on the other side, then the output will be 0. Right? That's how we, we will represent it mathematically or using this activation or uh, nonlinearity. So how do you want to classify this data? Which classifier? So let me let me let me actually ask. Uh, let me just give you the answer uh, or the classifier that I want. I want a classifier that looks like this. Okay. Yeah. So the classifier would be like if the if the sign of the multiplication of the sign with uh, the line. Over the lines positive, <coughs> under the lines negative. Right. If by both sides, and if it's positive, it's green, and if it's negative, it's red. You're giving me the answer different from this, or you're explaining this classifier? No, I'm, I'm, think, I'm telling you, I guess that's why I the answer. I got you. So I want to separate the, uh, I want to divide that into different steps. Right? Um, so each classifier, so each of these lines represent a classifier. Or perceptron, so they rep they they will represent one of these rows, for instance, in this expression. Okay, so we want to find those values, but right now I just want a visual answer that if you are given these two classifiers, how can you learn to separate the red points from the green points, right? And uh, you are multiplying the outputs together. We cannot multiply the outputs using a linear function. Um. Okay, so, but visually, uh, how do you want to, how would solve? Let, let's hear about that, some other answer. Yeah. Okay, what do you mean by first two right now? Okay. okay, not really. So we we have moved beyond finding a classifier on x1 and x2 directly. Right now, when I when I have drawn these lines, I thought we are we are talking about how can we find how can we use these lines or output of these linear classifiers to build a classifier that can separate the green points from the red points. So lines, these blue lines that I have represented, they represent a classifier, right? And I want to use the output of those two classifiers, linear classifiers, to separate the data into two classes. Yeah? If you add the two classifiers and you get two, it's red. But if you add the two classifiers and you get one, then it's green. The other classifier is blue. So give me an example. So, okay, so let's take the, the point D here. Right. The bottom line will what do you think the output of D will be? The first one returns a one, and the second one returns a 
Okay, let's also define what is the first and what is the second. So you are saying this is the first classifier and this is the second classifier. Yeah. Okay. So first one, let's write it down. So I don't know which one. Okay, on my notes, I want to just stay consistent with that. I am calling the top one as uh, as the first classifier and the bottom one as the second classifier. It doesn't change anything. So let's write down. So if we go by this uh, visually, we want to uh, we are defining this classifier such that the, the arrow is pointing towards the side that will be assigned one and the opposite side will be assigned zero. So these data points that you have here, uh, these ones, let me write them. X belongs to the space and then A, B, C, D, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. They will each be mapping to some output. So let's say this is the output for the first classifier, this is the output for the second classifier. Okay, and let me just color code them to indicate that this is the first classifier and this is the second classifier. So where will point A go based on these classifiers? First classifier will give an output of 0, right? Because A is on the negative side of the classifier. Oh no, wait. Yellow is 1. So first, Y1 would be 1. Right? A is on the correct side of that, positive side of that classifier. Y2 will be? Zero. Okay, what about B? B is this red point. It is on the correct side of, it is on the positive side of both classifiers. So output will be 1, 1. C, 1, 1. D, 0, 1. Right? D is on the, on the negative side of the first classifier and positive side of the second classifier. Okay, let's just quickly point plot these points onto two dimensional space. So where does this point go? One zero in this in this new representation. First point goes to one, first coordinate is one, second coordinate is zero. These two points go to one one. This last point goes to zero one. Okay, in our color coding. A was green, B was, so we are getting actually these, this kind of color coding. That A and A and B are mapping to these green points and B and C are mapping to that red point. In this representation, can we find a linear classifier to separate the data? The answer is yes. Okay? So we will wrap it up next time and we will find out what will be the values of these matrices that will give you this classification. All right.